Thank you. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Um, we're so happy you're joining us this evening. I'm so grateful to Jane Patterson for um, working on what I know will be a very informative and helpful program to all of us as we're learning um, more about using native plants to attract birds. This is the second part or the second talk of two that Jane has done for us. And we've been working really hard over the past couple of months to offer you um, a different selection of native plants that you can purchase tomorrow online after Jane's program tonight. Um, we're offering smaller trees than we did the first time. Um, a nice selection of shrubs because shrubs are so easy to fit in a landscape. Um, a selection of perennials, some grasses and vines. Um, tomorrow morning, I'll um, send a link to Jane to send to all the members of the Audubon Society so you can purchase the plants online. And then we'll have curbside pickup at Hilltop and for Hilltop members, um, I'll be sending you the link first thing tomorrow morning. So Jane, thank you so very much for doing this program. And I'll turn it over to you now. All right, thank you, Peggy. And I sure appreciate our great partnership with Hilltop Arboretum in supporting um, this, this mission of uh, plants for birds because they're both plants and birds are near and dear to my heart. So I love uh, talking about both subjects and this is a wonderful marriage of the two. Uh, just for housekeeping, um, I am recording this and we'll have it on our uh, YouTube channel later. And I think uh, Peggy's gonna make it available also um, via Friends of Hilltop. Uh, have everyone muted. Uh, please put any questions that you have into the chat and we'll save them for the end. So with that, I assume everybody can see my screen. If I can get a thumbs up, then you can see it. All right, we will get right to it. So we love watching birds. And right now, uh, since many of us have been confined at home now for most of a year, uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, doing that, watching birds in our yard. And attracting birds, uh, when, we, when we think of attracting birds, of course, we, we naturally think of putting out feeders and um, putting out feeders definitely works. It brings the birds close to us where we can see and enjoy them up close. But our feeders are kind of like fast food um, as opposed to the natural food that is like mom's home cooking. And like us, uh, birds prefer mom's home cooking. So when the birds don't come to your feeders, it's probably a good thing because they are eating what mother nature is providing. And be assured that birds are not relying solely on us for food. Uh, they must have insect protein as well as many other nutrients that nature provides. Uh, it would not be healthy for them to just eat um, bird seed and what we provide in our feeders. We're really hard on wildlife, generally speaking. Um, human population is growing at an exponential rate. And so the habitat for birds and other critters is shrinking. And habitat loss is one of the leading causes for loss of bird populations. Uh, this is an aerial view of an area at Tangipahoa Parish, and I, I can't help thinking of the birds, um, perhaps the, the migratory species that nested in this beautiful forest last year and returned from their winter home in Central America or South America, uh, hoping to, to um, make a new home again, only to find that it's now all the, that all the trees are gone and it's now dirt or concrete or houses. And people will say, well, well birds have wings. Can't they just go someplace else? But um, those other places are also occupied by birds. And uh, it would be kind of like you going on vacation, coming home to find that your house has been demolished and you trying to go move into your neighbor's house. I think a fight would ensue. So. It's kind of like the, kind of what, it's rather what we're doing to wildlife. We are creating these food deserts when we, when we um, uh, create these developments, many of them are created with the same type of landscaping, uh, usually grass, sod, uh, crepe myrtles, sago palms, Indian hawthorns, um, 
So we're not creating a food opportunity for these plants. Uh, and this, this conversation about native plants is, is quite literally a life and death conversation for our insects and for our birds. And your yard is critically important to uh, providing some of that, replacing some of that lost ecosystem. Um, one way to look at it is landscaping versus naturescaping. Uh, Doug Tallamy says, we've reduced our plants to ornamentation, just to decoration. We have forgotten their role in the ecosystem. As far as the landscaping is concerned, the most important thing is fitting in with the neighbors. And you look at this landscape, and certainly this is what a homeowner's association would consider beautiful. It's very tidy. It's very orderly. Um, and it's probably comprised mostly of foreign plants and doesn't provide a lot of ecological function. If you're not familiar with Dr. Tallamy, he is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware, and he's really been leading the charge for this uh, latest effort of um, educating people about using native plants in their gardens at, their, at home. Uh, these books, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and then he co-wrote the Living Landscape with Rick Dark are um, uh, focused on this particular subject and I highly recommend this. He really uh, communicates this, um, this message at a very personable level. You can also find his presentations on YouTube um, and they're, they're very enjoyable. Uh, Doug came to Baton Rouge uh, a little over a year ago now or was it two? Lord, how time is slipping away. Um, after his new book, Nature's Best, his latest book, Nature's Best Hope, came out, and uh, we really enjoyed his visit. Landscaping, our traditional landscaping, if you will, has really come to mean removing everything that was there before and plopping in things that are not native to the area. We, we remove even the dirt, and then we buy garden soil to put back, uh, and then we fill up the space with plants that are not even from North America. Naturescaping, on the other hand, is about looking at the place and looking at plants that go with the place and not changing the place for the plant. Uh, it's a form of ecological landscaping. We're creating self-sustaining, low-maintenance landscapes that function more like nature. And this, when it functions like nature, it means that it also provides food for animals. Plants provide pollen, nectar, forage material for insects, most of the landscaping plants that we buy in the nurseries are exotic species. Our insects don't even recognize them as food. Um, many, like these, um, these annual red salvia, they are bred for very large blooms that have nothing in the way of uh, anything to offer for insects. They have no nectar, um, probably not much pollen. Um, and uh, so they're, they're strictly ornamental as opposed to the annual, to, sorry, the fire sage, the salvia coccinia below uh, that is a native. And although the flower is smaller, it is, it is nectar rich and a favorite for hummingbirds and butterflies. A lot of our shrubs that have berries, um, the, the non-native berries may be high in sugar content but they contain little of the lipids and the, or fats uh, that migratory birds need for their, um, their journeys north or south. It really is time to rethink our plant choices. Using plants that are, are native to the area means more choices for our native birds and the wildlife. 90% of plant eating insects are specialists that only eat one or a few species of plants. And this is Dr. Tallinn as well. Non-native landscapes provide very little plant diversity. To survive, our native birds need those native plants and insects that have co-evolved with them over millennia. No insects means no birds. Another quote from Dr. Tallamy, 96% of all terrestrial birds species in North America feed insects to their young. So this clutch of chickadees, over the course of 16 days, after these baby chickadees hatched in the nest, mama and daddy fed those babies 9,000 insects, more than 9,000 insects until they left the nest. 9,000 insects over a period of 16 days. If those parents 
parent chickadees were not able to find insects to feed those babies, they would not have survived. This is a, a, my own story here at my house. I put up a, a motion sensitive camera to watch the Carolina wrens that were nesting on my porch. And uh, the motion sensitive camera would catch mo movement of the birds so I could see them coming and going and feeding these babies. And they visited over 200 times a day with food. There's no telling how many insects they brought to the four babies in this nest. Carolina tech wrens take about 21 days to adult. So that's easily over 4,000 visits and likely many more insects. Look at the toilet trained all the How many insects? So let's just do some math here. So a chickadee weighs about a third of an ounce, three to an ounce. You can mail three chickadees in one um, first class envelope. A Carolina wren is a little bit heftier at half of an ounce. Uh, a cardinal, 1.5 ounces, so five or six times as big as a chickadee. And a blue jay, a whopping three ounces, nine times as big as a chickadee. If all of these birds feed insects to their young, which they must in order for the babies to develop properly, they need the protein, how many insects does it take to raise a brood of these larger birds? The numbers are quite staggering. Caterpillars in particular are perfect baby food for birds. They're soft and squishy. Uh, mom and daddy can poke them in that baby's mouth really easily without injury. So they are the perfect baby food. Dr. Talamy's research has shown that oak trees in particular support more than 550 different species of Lepidoptera, butterflies, and moths. So that's a lot of caterpillars provided by oak trees. Non-native trees, like a ginkgo or a crepe myrtle, may not host any insects throughout their life cycle. We gardeners need a new pers perspective. You know, I, when I learned to garden, every little hole on a leaf required that I run to the, to the nursery to find out what poison I should put on the plant to keep whatever was chewing, at, chewing on it away. Um, but we need to shift that thinking now and realize that ca caterpillars are a cause for celebration. If you are creating a bird-friendly sanctuary in your yard, then instead of being pests, uh, these insects are now allies. And of course, everything requires a balance, and it may take a while to get to that balance. But native plants are often hardier than non-native ornamentals. And from a gardening perspective, that means you're not going to need as much uh, in the way of pesticides or fertilizers. It really makes your job easier. I know personally, when we just had the, the freeze that came through, uh, the plants that I was worried about were the, the tropicals, the ornamentals. The natives, I was not, not the least bit concerned with. I knew that they were going to make it through, and they have. And it's, we can absolutely have both beauty and function. So here's an oak tree. And, it's, and this oak tree is doing everything that we expect it to do. It's providing color, it's providing shade, it's providing that grandeur that an oak tree provides. It's aesthetically pleasing to us. But if we look up close to that oak, in that oak tree, we may see a few holes. We, we may see a few insects. That oak tree is teeming with life. So yes, there may be some damage if you look up close, but when you look from a distance from your neighbor's house, for example, uh, what we see is a beautiful tree. And certainly native plants can be ornamental. We all know our live oaks um, are, are just a, a gorgeous plant in and of themselves. Here's another example, an American holly. Uh, this naturally grows in the, just about the perfect tree shape. Uh, but an American holly, a native plant, will provide beauty, of course, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing shape, uh, cover for and um, protection for birds, nesting sites, and of course, food for both insects and birds. Plant diversity absolutely means bird diversity. So Talamy's research scientifically proved that if plant diversity, native plant diversity was increased, then bird diversity was also increased. In a study of suburban properties in Southeast Pennsylvania, they determined that when the alien plants were removed and natives were replaced, 
<clears throat> these yards contained eight times more wood thrushes, eastern towhees, veeries, and scarlet tanagers, which are all species of conservation concern. So they scientifically prove that adding natives back to a yard absolutely increases that diversity. In my yard, when I moved to this yard <clears throat> in 2016, um, we have a lot of lawn, we have crepe myrtles, we have a lot of non-natives, but I've been steadily adding more and more natives. And over four and a half years of bird watching in this yard, I've um, reported over 900, sorry, over 105 species, um, different species of birds. Now, 26 of those have been strictly flyovers like bald eagles and great egrets and things like that. 29 have been coming to feeders and then 50 have been in the trees and the shrubs that I've added to this yard or feeding on the ground. Uh, one of the, my most recent surprises was this yellow breasted chat that came in to eat elderberries in my yard. A yellow breasted chat will have no interest in seeds, um, but he found the elderberries and he was, he was gorging on them. So that was quite a treat. If you want warblers in your yard, um, you absolutely need to add insects because warblers basically only eat insects. I've documented 12 species of warblers in my yard uh, and our, our yards collectively become critical stopover habitat for these migrating birds. Louisiana is on the Mississippi Flyway. Uh, we are on, on the route that millions of migratory birds are using to get from their wintering homes in Central or South America to the northern part of North America for breeding. Uh, so our yards are becoming very critical to their survival. Doug Tallamy in his, in his book, um, Nature's Best Hope, talks about the homegrown national park. And uh, he specifically talks about our lawns, which he considers to be an ecological wasteland. 20 million acres of ecological wasteland, bigger than all of these national parks combined. If those lawns were converted into ecologically functioning landscapes, then we create these corridors and swaths of green space with native plant communities that provide uh, a greater, um, greater benefit ecologically than uh, all of our national parks, which are all disparate and distantly located. Oh, sorry, I want to back up for just a second. So, there's a website, he, he has created a website, homegrownnationalpark.org. And um, if you yourself have, um, have added native plants to your yard and you are basically, have you, if you've been a convert and uh, you've added native plants to your yard and you are consider yourself to be part of this homegrown national park, you can put yourself on the map. Uh, I checked the other day and I think we only have about 25 uh, locations in Louisiana that have been added uh, to this map. So certainly I know there are many more of you out there uh, that have already uh, been working on adding native plants and you could add yourselves to this map. Another um, source for figuring out what to use in your yard, the National Wildlife Federation partnered with Dr. Tallamy to create this native plant finder. Uh, so if you go to this website, you can put in your zip code and it will give you ideas of plants that support insects and butterflies in your yard. Jo uh, uh, Bill Fontenot, excuse me, <clears throat> um, worked with birders uh, several years ago to compile a list of uh, fruits that are used by birds across Louisiana. Uh, so he's got a list of plants and the birds that um, have been feeding on them. He created a report for the Louisiana Ornithological Society in 1998 but more recently, the Orleans Audubon Society reformatted this report into this really useful tool that shows a plant by plant account. Um, it tells when this bird, uh, sorry, when this plant um, produces fruit, 
uh, talks, talks a little bit about the plant, the plant, and then it lists all the birds that may use, um, that may use the, or that have been observed eating this fruit. Uh, so although Bill formatted, uh, created this report back in 1998, he is still updating it today with current information. I created a Facebook group called Plants for Birds in Louisiana, specifically to document which plants birds are using and not just for fruit, for seeds, for flowers, for anything, uh, just to so show the benefit of native plants and bird for birds. And birds can, or excuse me, fruit can certainly be available all season, not just in the spring or the summer, um, but all year long. We have many different choices. When we think of offering seeds to birds, um, it's not only seeds in our feeders, we can offer seeds in the form of plant seeds. This is an American elm. One elm will hold hundreds, thousands of seeds. Uh, so if you have several of them, you're offering a whole buffet uh, to a wide number of birds. This is an American goldfinch eating American elm seeds. And there's, of course, lots of, of trees that provide seeds, some uh, not every year, uh, like oak trees, um, but others certainly every year. Offering flowers. When we think of flowers for birds, uh, we naturally think of something that a hummingbird would use, and we have some great natives for that. Turk's cap, coral honeysuckle, trumpet creeper, and others. But in addition to providing flowers specifically um, to birds, we also can provide flowers uh, that are beautiful and provide value to insects. Because remember, if we're, if we're gardening for birds, then we're gardening for insects as well. And flowering trees count too. Every tree that's going to produce a nut or a seed or a berry at one time has flowers on it. And sometimes the birds actually eat these flowers. This is an orange crowned warbler eating the flowers on a black willow tree. Tender foliage is a favorite with many birds as well. If you go outside and observe this right now, as the trees are leafing out, you can see cardinals and other birds nibbling on the tender emerging foliage. Uh, they, need their, they need their greens just like we do. And then our shrubs and trees offer cover for protection from predators, for nesting, for roosting, for preening after they've bathed, uh, offer a lot of value there. So how do you know which plants you should choose? Well, one of the ways on the National Audubon website, there's a, a, a page uh, called Plants for Birds. You put in your zip code and it produces a downloadable list of plants specifically recommended and that are appropriate for your area. And it lists not only the name of the plant, the way that it grows, the growth habits and requirements, but also what kind of birds it might attract to your yard. The goal for National Audubon Society is to have more than a million plants, native plants, um, installed across the United States. And one of the, the uh, support um, items that they're using for this effort is this sign. So for a donation, you receive this beautiful sign and you can hang it in your yard for your friends and neighbors. And it, it allows, it really becomes a great talking point because uh, then it, it opens up the conversation with your neighbors to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, maybe talk about birds that, you, that you've been bringing to your yard now that you've changed the, the habitat uh, to be more inclusive of native plants. Another great local reference that I cannot recommend highly enough is Bill Fontenot's book, Native Gardening in the South. So Bill is a landscape designer, but he's also a birder and a naturalist. Um, and this book is, is um, it's entertaining, um, but it's a great plant by plant account of um, wonderful native plants that we can incorporate into our garden. And he also talks a lot about how to, how to use them in your garden plan. You can find Bill on Facebook uh, as The Nature Dude and uh, contact him that way to get a copy of the book. 
sometimes it's not about adding plants, it's more about managing the plants you already have. Uh, so you may have um, a large uh, tree in your yard that's declining, a snag, if you will. As long as it's uh, not an imminent danger of uh, falling on your house, your neighbor's house, a person, a car, anything like that, if it's in the back of the property where it won't cause harm and you can leave it there, it provides all sorts of value to wildlife. Owls absolutely uh, love to use large cavities for nesting and uh, you may end up with this in your backyard. And who wouldn't want these fuzzy babies in their yard? Just wonderful. <laughs> if you want woodpeckers, again, those snags are vitally important to woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are not killing the trees. They're going after the insects that are working on breaking down that tree after it is already dead or diseased. And the woodpeckers are going for those insects. So again, if you can leave snags safely on your property, uh, you'll see an increase. I watched one water oak one year support three different families of different species of woodpeckers in one season. Flycatchers, we don't think of this as a, a, a yard bird particularly, but the great crested flycatcher uses these snags. It uses old woodpecker holes. So after the woodpeckers have moved out, the next year, the, um, the great crested flycatcher may, may move in. Real sparrows. So we get, we have birds like house sparrows all year long, which, which are not actually real sparrows. Uh, they're imported and they're in the finch family, but real sparrows come to visit us in the wintertime and they love brush piles and tangles. Uh, so again, rather than hauling that stuff out to the curb, um, leave it to decay naturally in a, that part of your property uh, where it won't uh, cause, cause issues. And uh, you'll find that it, um, a lot of wildlife is attracted to that for, for cover um, and foraging. Leaving tangles and thickets. There are some birds that just prefer that type of habitat. The beautiful eastern towhee, the brown thrasher, they like to be in the thick of it, in the tangles and thickets. And so there may be a part of your yard that you can leave wild and tangled like that. The birds will thank you for it. Leaving the leaves. Uh, this has become kind of a, uh, a watchword these days. Instead of raking all that good um, material up, uh, leaving the leaves where uh, they can decay naturally uh, provides value to the soil, but it also um, offers overwintering homes, if you will, for many different insects that um, that pupate in the in the tr in the leaves, uh, including fireflies. Uh, so if you leave the leaves, you may find a whole another adding a whole another set of um, of animals, and including birds, to your yard that you never noticed before. And it's just. You know, as gardeners, we're, we're quick to cut things back after they're dead. Um, but if we resist this impulse and just let things go through their natural cycles, it really gives a sense of time and place uh, to our gardens. And we can embrace these seasonal changes. We can appreciate that the garden is going to look different in the winter than it does in the spring or the summer. Uh, this purple coneflower certainly is aesthetically pleasing when it's blooming, but it also has a nice architectural flair when it's not. And we do have to be careful. Just because a plant is native does not automatically make it great. So you do have to do your research. A water oak, for example, uh, is a great tree for wildlife, but it is a relatively short-lived tree for an oak. Uh, water oaks, they say, this is a, a quote I heard a while back, water oaks live for about 70 years. They take 30 years to grow and 40 years to die. And those are big, heavy limbs. Um, you certainly don't want them um, uh, over your, your house or your fence. So how do you get started with all this? Does this mean then that you have to rip out every non-native plant in your yard or garden? No, let's, let's, uh, let's take it a step at a time. So what you can do is when you're adding something new, um, try to make that choice a native plant. When you're replacing something that died, choose a native. So when I moved into this house in Ponchatoula in the, my front yard, 
There was one pretty sickly Japanese magnolia in the middle of the lawn. Uh, so I started, in, started installing native plants. Uh, I also, if I have non-natives, usually they're hummingbird plants or they're pollinator plants. So in this, in this bed, which has grown over the years, I uh, have Texas star hibiscus, Joe pie, a Tai Tai tree, which is probably four times as big as this now, um, red canna, porter weed, crinum lily, Louisiana iris, and bog sage. So it's become a nice little um, ornamental bed. In the, the late summer, it is a buzz, a glow with pollinators. You want to aim for at least 70% native plant biomass in your yard. Now this is a this is a three-dimensional uh, measurement. Um, so it's not just you know um, not just the width and the length of your yard but also the height. So this study that was done in 2018 um, investigated the uh, occurrence of successful bird breeding and population growth with non-native plants. And basically what the, the study produced was that it, it proved that a yard needed more than 70% native plant biomass in order for those birds that lived in that area to sustain that local po population. When the number of natives dropped to less than 70%, the probability of sustaining those species plummets to zero. So this harks back to that study with the, the uh, chickadees. Basically, if those chickadees, in, if in their territory, their nesting territory, they cannot find enough insects, uh, insects that are reliant on native plants uh, to feed to their young, then those young will not survive. That chickadee population will not survive. So this is actually my yard in Ponchatoula, and you can see there's a whole lot of grass there. There's crepe myrtles, there's Indian hawthorn, there's Confederate jasmine, there's chase trees, there's sweet olive, and et cetera, et cetera. The saving grace from my yard is a very large maple tree and several very large oak trees and pine trees. Uh, so uh, I have also removed the Indian hawthorn uh, and many of the ornamentals up around the house and replaced those with natives. So I'm shifting that balance. You do need a plan. You can't just throw out weed seeds and expect to have a wonderful looking garden. Uh, for one thing, we have way too many exotic plants that can just take over. Uh, if you've ever um, ever had to fight um, what is it? chamber bitters, oh my Lord, um, you know that you can't just let things go. You've got you've to have a plan, you've got to manage it. Uh, so you need to, to put something on paper and you need to work that plan for four season interest. And where are you going to find native plants? Well, unfortunately, it's not as easy as you think um, because our nurseries really are not focused on this. A lot of our nurseries don't carry them or if they do, it's an accident. So, and you also have to be careful. You might recognize when you go into this nursery, you see that the the uh, plant tag says that this is Yopon holly, Alex Bimatoria, which you know to be a native. However, these particular plants, this dwarf Yopon, is cloned from a male plant, uh, so it will never have produced berries. Um, but it's, it, the tag doesn't tell you that. So uh, there is a cultivar called Nana, which is female, which does produce berries if you are looking for a dwarf Yopon. So on the Vatnerj Audubon website, under the, our native plant guide, uh, I've compiled a list of sources for native plants, in mostly in South Louisiana. Um, and I'm always looking to update that information. So if you ever become aware of a, uh, a place to buy native plants in South Louisiana, please do let me know. Hilltop Arboretum is one of those great places. So their hodgepodge sells plants um, year round and holds twice annual plant sales that feature many natives, not all natives, but many native plants. And certainly for this event, they have stocked native plants specifically that attract birds and insects for this event. So uh, you should have received a list uh, when you receive the notification about this um, event. And uh, as Peggy said, the link 
uh, to order plants will be sent out tomorrow and then you pick up your plants over the next week or so. And this, the plants I'm going to talk about today are, are by no means the, the end all be all. Uh, this is just what Peggy found to be available. So I'm going to, going to go through and talk about their value uh, to birds and to, to uh, insects. Uh, but you absolutely should look for other sources and other plants as well. So one of these um, small trees that Peggy mentioned is the southern crab apple. Uh, this would be a great understory plant. Uh, um, the plants in this family have been documented to attract more than 150 species of butterflies and moths. And uh, this is one that will tolerate heavy, our heavy so soils. Uh, so this would be a great one. And of course, it's going to produce uh, fruit for the birds in the summer. The Southern Catalpa, this is a little bit larger tree. Um, it is monaceous, so it doesn't require a male and a female. Uh, if you've ever seen one in bloom, it's just absolutely gorgeous in bloom with large showy flowers and big leaves. Uh, and it is famous for the Catalpa worms. So if you're a, a fisher person, uh, you might like this for uh, for producing worms for fishing, but also the yellow-billed cuckoos love the caterpillars uh, and it hosts another eight or so species of Lepidoptera. It produces large cigar-like pods and if you notice those pods are familiar, um, this tree is in the same family as crossvine and, and trumpet creeper, which I found to be interesting. River birch is another great one. Uh, this is actually often used by landscapers already. Uh, great native, so it's a fast growing tree with a lot of interest in its bark. Um, it should be sited in a, a moist area. It does cope well with compacted soil. And uh, the songbirds eat the, the seeds and the flowers. And birches, and as a family, support more than 400 species of Lepidoptera. So this is a, a star when it comes to ecological function. The native fringe tree, this tree can be an absolute showstopper when it's in bloom. Uh, people will come knock on your door and want to know what plant it is. Um, I have a, a little one in the front, and even just at, at four feet tall, I get questions. So this is a small tree that grows up to a max of about 30 feet. And the female plants also pr produce a, uh, a droop, it looks like a grape that the birds are going to eat. And it, it um, provides some, it also is a host plant for at least 10 species of Lepidoptera. You do wanna make sure when you're buying a fringe tree that you're buying the American um, version and not the Chinese variety because there is a Chinese variety that is popular in the trade and it is, um, uh, it looks very similar. Swamp Tai Tai, Cyrilla racemiflora. This is a great little tree. I have one in the front uh, I mentioned earlier. Mine is about 12, 13 feet tall now. It generally stays under 30 feet and uh, it will uh, adapt to different climates. It'll grow in practically in standing water, um, but it will also grow in dry, drier areas as well. As well. And these wonderful drooping blooms that appear on the, the plant uh, stay basically for almost the entire year. They turn to a beautiful golden color after they finish, um, after the blooms dry up. And uh, it is a pollinator magnet when it's in bloom. You see all sorts of uh, insects around this, this plant. And then we get into the shrubs. Uh, American Beauty Berry is a favorite. Uh, this is another one that people are, are often, that when people grow this, people are often asked about um, the name of this plant because the, the berries uh, contrasting with the green leaves are very uh, ornamental. Uh, this shrub can reach uh, three to five feet tall, although the ones at Hilltop Arboretum did not get the, mem the memo because they are easily 10 or 12 feet tall. Um, you can cut these back and control them. So if you have a certain space that you want to uh, grow these in, they do um, take to, to uh, cutting back. The flower is pretty inconspicuous. It's pretty, but it's pretty small. But the real value of this plant in terms of ornamentation is the, um, the berries that produced, are produced in the fall 
and those berries are loved by birds as well. Airwood viburnum is a very hardy plant. It grows in uh, a number of different areas. It, as it says here, tolerant of most soil types and exposures, basically can grow this just about anywhere. And it produces these clusters of blooms and then clusters of berries. Um, and look at this. The berries contain 41% fat. So these are very lipid rich, um, wonderful for migrating birds as they're moving to their winter ground, uh, wintering ground in, uh, in fall. So super, super plant here. Uh, devil wood is a type of wild olive. So it has the glossy leathery leaf that you might think of on an olive tree and a dark olive-like fruit as well. Um, it does prefer shade and, or part shade, excuse me, and rich soil. So it's another good understory tree. The flowers are extremely fragrant and attract pollinators. And this one can be pruned to a size or shape that you want as well. Starbush. Uh, this is a shrub that grows to about 10 feet. Um, the, the leaves and the flowers are very aromatic. Um, pungent is a, a word that is used by some. Not always pleasantly pungent, but um, this plant prefers, prefers moist, uh, rich soil in the shade. So it's, this is another great understory plant. And next, in your next visit to Hilltop Arboretum, um, you should walk the trail because there is a starbush, uh, a couple of them, I think, in bloom right now with these beautiful reddish to purple flowers in the spring. Fetter bush is an interesting one with these arching branches with the, the, uh, the flowers hanging down. Uh, grows to three to five feet with these urn shaped flowers. This is one that produce, pre prefers acidic soil. Uh, so if you have pine trees and you, you know that your soil is acidic, um, this might be one that appeals to you. And the pollinators like the blooms. Gallberry uh, is in the holly family. So this is a dioecious member of the holly family, but it has black berries. So it's also called inkberry um, instead of the red. And this is kind of a, a colony forming shrub. So it'd be great for a low hedge or a border. Uh, there are a couple of cultivars um, available that, that stay smaller. So, and this, this plant is found naturally in acidic bogs. Um, so probably in areas that once were home to the longleaf pine. Uh, so it's gonna pref prefer the moist to wet acidic soil. And of course, berries are going. Uh, birds are going to eat the berries and also use the shrubs, shrubs for cover. Hollies are very important to over four, 40 species of caterpillars and moths, uh, moths and butterflies. Excuse me. Rusty blackhaw viburnum. So the viburnum family is large, has many different plants in it. The, all different properties. Um, this particular one grows to about 18 feet. Uh, the fruit is a fleshy blue-black uh, cluster, which the birds will eat. Uh, this is one that um, prefers sandy soil or loam rather than the compacted soil or clay. Uh, so you'll have to be careful of where you're going to place this one. And viburnums as a group, the native viburnums host over 67 species of butterflies and moths. Dwarf mat wax myrtle. So if you go anywhere along the, uh, the edges of our swamps, you're going to find wax myrtle, the traditional mat wax myrtle, which stays or gets to about um, 15 or so feet. The dwarf variety stays under four feet and it produces these clusters of uh, waxy berries along the stems. So this is a moisture loving plant. It's gonna tolerate the wet areas in the sun or in the park shade in your yard. And the, um, the, the stems will be basically covered in waxy berries on the female plants in the winter time. The yellow rumped warbler is also called the myrtle warbler. And this is a favorite food for, um, for those birds. 
this might be a great substitute for an Indian hawthorn in the right location. This one is really interesting. It's a holly, but it's deciduous. So after, um, after a freeze, it loses its leaves, but the berries persist. Uh, so this is a, a great um, uh, accent plant in the winter time. You get to have these dense clusters of bright red berries that remain through the winter. And I imagine right now uh, they're probably devoid of their berries because all the hot, all the uh, robins and cedar waxwings that we're having have probably found every single winterberry plant and eaten all the berries. But this is another one that is very adaptable. It can grow in the sun or the shade. It can grow in wet sites with very poor drainage, but also in drier sites. Uh, so very adaptable. Dwarf palmetto. Um, you talk about a plant that is perfect for the, the place. This is another one like our, um, our cypress, like our live oak, the dwarf palmetto really uh, speaks about the, the deep south in Louisiana. A dwarf, uh, I guess, is relative to how tall a palm tree might get. It's still pretty large uh, for a, a plant. It get, can get up to five to 10 feet tall and just as wide. Uh, so this is a great accent plant. It's got that very architectural interest. Um, so it can be perfect to fill a space over time. It has these large leaves. It has spikes of white blooms that are, uh, produce clusters of fruit uh, that are eaten by all sorts of wildlife. And it is um, one that will grow in a wetter area. It is um, adaptable to, it has adapted to flooding. Um, but if you look at it in the natural areas, it's, it doesn't grow in standing water. It grows in the next layer up. So this is a, a can be a great addition to your yard. And then we have a few perennials. One of my absolute favorites, I cannot get enough of this plant, is salvia coccinea, scarlet sage, fire sage, Texas sage. This is a hummingbird magnet. Now uh, these flowers, although they're small, they have a very high sugar content. Um, so the, the hummingbirds just absolutely love it. Many butterflies will as well. Um, this one is classified as a tender perennial or a self-seeding annual. So as it, as the blooms are spent, it produces spikes of, um, of seeds. And you can just take that, those uh, spent flower stalks off and shake the seeds over the, the garden to produce more plants or start them in pots um, for the next year. Save seeds, it produces lots of seeds. This grows in sun or light shade. It'll bloom sporadically through the summer, but it really is a showstopper in the fall when the, um, the ruby-throated hummingbird is migrating to Central America for the winter. Copper iris, on the other hand, blooms in perfect um, uh, conjunction with the return of the ruby-throated hummingbird from its wintering grounds in the spring. So it is one of the few iris that actually has nectar. Uh, so it does attract the ruby-throated hummingbird. And of course, as with other Louisiana iris species, it grows in moist to wet areas. So it should be starting to bloom now any day. Seaside goldenrod. So people tend to be worried, tend to be scared of goldenrods. There's so many solidago um, uh, varieties, but this one, um, this was a volunteer in my yard, and it, it, it uh, produces this, um, this clump of um, fleshy leaves with a flower stalk that the first time when I let it grow, it grew to over eight feet tall. Um, but then on Bill Fontenot's advice, when it got to be about, about four feet, I cut it back to about one foot so that when it, um, when it uh, grew again, it produced uh, a bloom only about four feet tall, which was perfect in the space in my yard. So this is not one that um, spreads by rhizomes like the more common goldenrod. Uh, so it, it's, it's controlled and the clump has gotten larger now and it really is a nice accent in the, in the yard. Um, it blooms in late summer. So it blooms when a lot of the, the purple asters are blooming. 
um, just about the same time as my um, um, the other uh, the Joe Pye weed and some of those others. So it's really nice contrast in color. So uh, Solidago is a favorite with many species of butterflies and moths. And uh, it just can be a really nice accent plant in your yard. Pickerel weed. So we see this a lot in, uh, in our ditches and roadsides and um, edges of swamp areas. Uh, this is a water plant that's great for a boggy area that holds water. It grows this beautiful purple um, flower spike. Uh, I did not know until I was researching for this presentation that the seeds can be eaten like nuts. So um, I'm interested in this and I may try to go find some seeds for some pickerel weed in the fall and see, see how they taste. Uh, but I do know that this plant is a wonderful attractor for pollinators. Willow leaf aster, so there are dozens and dozens of asters. Uh, you really can't go wrong with asters as far as providing fall interest, um, food for butterflies. This is a favorite with the monarch butterfly as it's uh, traveling on its migratory path. Uh, but then once the blooms are spent, it provides seeds for birds. This is an orange crown warbler eating aster in my yard. And then we have a few grasses. Uh, so grasses are, are great. We, I think we really overlook grasses as ornamentals in our yard or to provide um, interest and contrast. Uh, this is one broom, broom sedge blue stem uh, produces this brushy um, stalk that in the winter stays all winter and has this beautiful sort of tawny brown color. Uh, it's very tolerant of almost any, loc any sunny location. And uh, I did have uh, goldfinches eating this plant in my yard this year. Switchgrass. So two different um, cultivars of switchgrass are being offered. Uh, this is a clump forming uh, perennial grass um, that could be a really nice accent or um, sort of a back of the border plant in your yard. You want to plant it in full sun for the most color. Um, you could do it a clump as a specimen, or you could uh, plant a, a plant them in a row for a hedge or a screen, uh, or in a mass for a, a prairie setting. Uh, and these will be attractive to pollinators as well as songbirds. And then they're offering one vine, uh, the American wisteria. So not the native invasive Chinese wisteria, um, but this is one that's a, not as aggressive as the, um, the Asian species, but it is in the pea family. And so it attracts um, pollinators and is a host plant for skipper butterflies. So it uh, can be a beautiful addition if you've got an arbor in your yard. So there's the list and hopefully you'll find something that uh, will appeal to you and that you can add uh, uh, work into your, your landscape. Uh, we know that there aren't enough sources for native plants, and the best thing that we can do is create the demand, go to our nurseries uh, so that the growers and the retailers continue uh, to stock the plants that, or start to stock the plants that we want. Once you get things going, share your success stories. So share plant cuttings if you've got things that are working or seeds uh, and spread the word and let people know what kind of success you're having with native plants. Promote this whole idea. So that's one of the reasons I created the Plants for Birds in Louisiana Facebook page to get people excited about this. So share those stories with other people so that they, um, they're, interested, they're interested and might take this on as well. There are several native plant societies uh, that can provide support. The statewide Louisiana Native Plant Society in Baton Rouge, we have Capital Area, and then in Lafayette, Acadiana Native Plant Project, and in New Orleans, the New Orleans Native Plant Initiative. I would follow these uh, folks on Facebook to see what all they're doing and find out about events and uh, share information. Several of them are very active. So, will you have birds in your yard if you don't have native plants? Probably, possibly. Surely you'll have a mockingbird and a cardinal. 
But if you want diversity and a yard full of healthy, happy birds, then add more natives. And we have come to the end here. here. Here's some contact information for me and for Peggy, and also some links uh, for some of the, um, the things that I referenced in my presentation. And I will stop sharing now so that I can see you. We'll see if there are any questions. I don't see a question. I do see somebody had a problem seeing the slides and hopefully she was able, they were able, I can't see who that is, but hopefully they were able to resolve that and, um, and see, but if they weren't, then hopefully they'll be able to go to YouTube and see the presentation there and review the information in the slides. So and does anybody have questions? I, I have. Uh, it said it was on Facebook Live, but uh, it was not being shown on Facebook Live tonight. The presentation, it said it was supposed to be on Facebook Live. So if, if I said that, I might have confused it with our presentation for Thursday that will be on Facebook Live. Oh, okay. Yeah, our regular Baton Rouge Audubon presentation is this Thursday. It's um, uh, Laura Erickson is going to speak to us, and that will definitely be on Facebook Live. Look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I wanted to know, where did you get all these plants? I know you moved not too long ago. Was it, what, three years, four years that you moved after 16 flood? Yes. And uh, your plants have done really well. I mean, they've grown and all that. And where did you get them? I've had real bad luck with all these native plants that I have bought. I have bought many of them and all of them have died. Oh, good. Right. I mean, um, right now I have a hedge, you know, 40 years old of ligustrums. And every time I think of cutting them and, you know, planting something else, but I've had so many.